Hello and welcome to The Wild Side. I am your host, Caitlin Kite. And this week we are going to be talking about wicked plants. And if you were listening last week, you might remember that my topic of migration was inspired by a current event, specifically Vladimir Putin helping some migratory cranes make their way from Siberia southwards. Well, this week is also inspired by something else that I saw in the news. It's actually a topic that I was kind of thinking about talking about for a while, but then this particular news item uh, really just drove it home. It seemed like the perfect time. So if you were paying attention to the news, you might have heard about this naked monk that was encountered in a German forest last week. And it turned out that the guy had eaten poisonous berries while he was out on a camping trip. And this had caused him to experience hallucinations and have partial paralysis. And the doctors eventually came to the conclusion that he had eaten the berries of a nightshade plant, uh, otherwise known as Atropa belladonna. And uh, of course, if you know anything about botany, you know that nightshade is quite a toxic plant, pretty much from the roots all the way to the tips of the leaves. And actually just brushing up against it can cause huge welts to form on your skin. So you would imagine uh, that eating the berries is quite bad. And that's because the berries contain something called atropine, which is an alkaloid, uh, also scopolamine and hyoscamine. And all of these things together disrupt the activities of your parasympathetic nervous system. And that's the part of your body that regulates involuntary activities like digestion and heart rate and salivation, that sort of thing. Uh, and actually, in low doses, it can be a useful product. So it's used by doctors to control stomach spasms and to keep motion sickness under control and also to maintain a normal heart rate during surgery. But obviously, as you, as you might imagine, if you have enough of these things, that can really disrupt everything, especially the heart rate, and be lethal in large doses. So atropine, um, actually, interestingly, another use of it is that you can add it to addictive drugs or potentially addictive drugs to make sure that people who are taking them are not ever going to become hooked on these drugs because they're so unpleasant because of these side effects related to atropine. So uh, it, it helps make sure that they will only take as much as they need for their condition and then stop taking it when the prescription is through. And another kind of unusual use of it is that it can be used as an antidote to poisoning from nerve gas and also pesticide exposure. And if you know anything about the history of nightshade, one of the first things you ever learn about this plant is that Italian women supposedly used to drop mild tinctures of nightshade into their eyes because it would dilate their pupils and supposedly make them look more alluring to men. So people who ingest nightshade, like this poor monk in Germany, can experience confusion and uh, exhibit unusual behavior. They can have a fast and irregular heartbeat and a flushed face. And among other things, they also can have a fever, and doctors think that that's maybe why this monk ended up taking, up all of his, taking off all of his clothes, is because potentially he got extremely hot and was delirious and in, in the process just took off his clothing in order to cool down. Uh, and actually, med school students, they supposedly use a mnemonic to help remember all the symptoms of nightshade, and that is hot as a hare, blind as a bad, bat dry as a bone, red as a beet, and mad as a hatter. So as you can imagine, this monk probably had quite an interesting experience last week whenever he ingested these berries. Now, the whole reason that I'm giving you all of this history and talking about plants is because I actually think that this sort of plant knowledge is quite exciting and interesting and, and very useful. And I've always been very interested in being able to identify all of the plants that I see around me and actually, in general, I like being able to kind of take a walk outside and, and know what it is that I'm looking at, whether it's useful in some way, can I eat it, can I grow it, can I mix it with something if I have a headache, you know, that sort of thing. And so I've always been really interested in, in thinking about all these sorts of, of characteristics of plants out in the wild. And what I think is really sad is that lots of people tend to think that botany is quite boring. And I know this because I used to be a botany teaching assistant when I was a, a master's student. And I always tried to use stories like this of the, the monk and the, the history of nightshade in order to show them that actually plant, plants can be really exciting and they can be useful and it can give you a good story and, and you know, be interesting. So it's not just you know, some dull topic where you just sit at a microscope and dissect a bunch of leaves while looking through the microscope. It can be a lot more than that if you learn about botany. So hopefully I can use that same trick today to get you guys excited about the idea of plants and learning to identify plants and, and thinking that maybe plants are just as exciting 
uh, some of the animals that you might be interested in viewing in your backyard. And another reason that I wanted to do this is because I think that we tend to, to let down our guard a lot when we think about plants because we say, well, you know, it's, it's natural so it has to be safe and it's, you know, it's something that we grow in the backyard or we find it in our homes and so of course it's going to be safe for us. It's not, it, even if it's not going to be safe, it's at least not going to be dangerous. But actually that's, that's not true and people have this tendency to do things like go out for a hike and try some berries that they see in the woods or they might uh, brew some tea from leaves that they see out in the yard or collect mushrooms and give them a try. And especially important is the idea of, you know, if you've got kids that you bring into your house or if you bring home a, a puppy or a kitten, you have to, you know, foolproof your house, house to make sure that, that these small creatures aren't going to be coming across anything dangerous. And we cover up pointy corners and we get rid of electric sockets and things like that. But lots of people forget to think about the plants that they have around the house and whether these things can be toxic as well. And so I'm hoping that by all the, all the things that I'll talk about today, we'll show that plants deserve kind of a guarded respect, to use the, the words of someone whose book I was reading while doing this research. Um, because while they can nourish and heal, they can also be very destructive. And before I talk any further about plants, I'm going to play a, a bit of a tribute song here, and that is uh, Danger Mouse and Danielle Lupi singing The Rose with the Broken Neck. And that was Danger Mouse and Danielle Lupi, uh, and you'll also probably notice Jack White singing The Rose with the Broken Neck. And this week I'm going to try to play you guys a few more songs. The last few weeks I've been slacking off a little bit and talking too much, so hopefully I can lighten the mood a bit with some more music. So before the break I was talking about how we are discussing today wicked plants, and I also mentioned that there was a book that I was reading while I was doing the research for this. And it's a great book. Uh, with actually the same name as the broadcast. It's where I took my inspiration. And I will provide details for that book. Uh, it's by Amy Stewart. I'll put that up on the website because it's really a fun and interesting read. And it's also got some, some really lovely drawings in it as well. Uh, and one of the things that Amy writes about is how there are certain botanical crime families where there are some families that just seem to have more species than are toxic than you might expect. So I'm going to discuss a few of those. And the one that I'm going to start off with is it's probably the, the one that, with which you're most familiar. It's the one I've already been discussing, and that's the nightshade family, or Solanaceae. And as, as the author says, these are both the best and the worst. And if you know anything about botany, what you'll know is that nightshade family actually includes lots of things that we are, really can't live without. And that includes potatoes, and peppers, and eggplants, and tomatoes, and even uh, petunia, which is not something that produces food for us, but which lots of people put out in their gardens or on their, on their balconies and porches and stuff. And in this same family, even though you've got these nice, edible, lovely things, you've also got some really deadly things like nightshade, mandrake, tobacco, henbane, belladonna, and datura. And many of these, like uh, the nightshade, contain uh, alkaloids. So for example, tropane alkaloids. And these things can cause hallucinations and seizures and comas. Now potatoes specifically are something that are interesting to talk about because these guys, obviously, here we are eating them. But actually, if you'll notice, we almost always eat them cooked. You, you basically can't have a potato raw. And this was news to me when I first found out about it because when I was little, I used to go in and sneak little slices of potatoes when my parents were cooking. And if you have really small doses of them, it's not a problem. But they do contain solanine. And if you have lots of solanine in your system, it can cause gastrointestinal symptoms. And if you have enough, it can actually lead to coma or death. So if you've ever had a dish where you've accidentally undercooked the potato a bit, you might notice that the next day or later on that day, you don't feel so well, and that's probably because of the solanine. And actually, if you, uh, if you have potatoes with green spots, you shouldn't eat them, or you should at least cut out the green section, because this, increase, uh, this indicates an increased level of solanine and that often is brought on by exposure to sunlight. So depending on where these things have been stored, you could have more solanine being produced in certain parts of the potato. And actually, sometimes if you have a bag of potato chips, or crisps as you guys would call them, uh, you'll, you'll notice that some of the, the chips, the individual chips themselves, have little green spots. And again, if you have these in small 
quantities, it's not that big of a deal. But in general, you should pick those out and not eat those because, again, it contains the solanine, and that's not going to do your digestive system any favors. Now, another botanical crime family is the cashew family, which, again, might be surprising to you because, of course, there are things that we eat in this family. And that includes stuff like mangoes and pistachios and, of course, cashew, and also even the ginkgo tree. And all of these guys uh, are related to species that you might not be as familiar with here, but I'm very familiar with from, from my home. And that's poison ivy and poison oak and poison sumac. Uh, and obviously the names of those kind of give away that they're not the greatest plants to come in contact with. Also the lacquer tree and the poisonwood tree, which you might have read about if you read Barbara Kingsolver's Poisonwood Bible, which is all about kind of using that tree as a metaphor because it is quite toxic to the point where even if you, uh, if you burn it, and inhale the smoke, it can be really uncomfortable. And that's actually something that's true also of mango and cashew trees. And these guys contain something that's called, I'm not really sure how to pronounce this properly, uh, so I apologize, but urushiol, or urushiol. Ur and this is something that, again, if, if it uh, goes up in flames and produces smoke, when you inhale it, you can have horrible um, burnt lung symptoms, and it's very painful and itchy and raw. And if you touch that before it's even burned, it can also cause uh, long-lasting, painful rashes on your flesh. So in all forms, that product is very uncomfortable. And all of these plants have related uh, products in their leaves, in their bark, in their pretty much in every bit of them. And actually, in order to eat a cashew, you have to steam open the whole product. So actually, the cashew is inside, you know, the nut is inside. Uh, case and you have to steam open the case in order to then reach in and get the cashews out because if you try to manhandle the case yourself and, and peel back the parts of it in order to then reach in and get the nut then you'll have touched that and gotten the oil on your fingers and, or machinery whatever you're using and then you'll end up transferring that to the nut itself and so you'll notice if you go to the store and buy cashews you're never actually going to get something that's truly raw, and that's because they have to be steamed to some extent so that they can open up those cases and get the nuts out in order to eat them. And these, uh, all these kind of nut shapes and, and fruit shapes, these are common to a lot of these species. So you've got, with the trees and the shrubs, they produce what's called a droop, and that's a big seed that's surrounded by a hard pit that's again then surrounded by sweet, juicy flesh like what you see in the mango. Now another thing that you guys are very familiar with, that actually I was not aware of until quite late in my life, is the nettle family, or urticaceae. And these guys are painful because they have what's called urticating hairs. So they take, they've taken the name of these hairs from the family name for these plants. And these, uh, these hairs cause painful itchy hives, as you probably are well aware from having encountered them at some point uh, while you're out walking somewhere. And actually doctors call the whole condition of painful itchy hives, urticaria, and again, that is based on the, the hairs of these plants and the family name of the nettles. And the nettles often, it's not just this painful little prick that sticks into your skin, but also they can have poison on top of those little, um, the little needles themselves. And so when they go into your skin, they then inject a dose of poison. And there's one plant that's widely considered the world's most painful plant, and that's the Australian stinging tree. And as you might imagine, uh, given the context in which I'm discussing it, it is also part of the nettle family. And what's really interesting is that actually you can eat these. You would never expect this when you first encounter them. But as long as you boil them and to get rid of the hairs and to uh, denature the protein that's involved in that, uh, the stinging pain if it gets under your skin, then it's actually quite safe to eat these. And the first time that I ever encountered nettles was when I worked for a summer in the Shenandoah National Park in the U.S. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure of the distribution of the plant in the U.S., but I think that it's not really widely found. It's only found in certain types of habitat, uh, and, and up on the mountain was one of those types of habitat. And it was the first time in my life I'd ever brushed against the plant and had this horrific pain that you guys probably have all the time because nettles are everywhere in this country. And uh, I was working with some, some colleagues who were, you know, very keen botanists, and they said, well, let's try and experiment and collect some of this. And so we did, in fact, gather a whole bunch of nettles, and we boiled them, and we produced kind of like what you would do if you were preparing collard greens or spinach, cooked spinach. But it didn't have much flavor at all. It was pretty boring. 
And I think if you're interested in ever cooking up nettles yourself, you're going to want to put a whole lot of butter and a whole lot of salt in order to give them a bit more flavor. So I can't imagine that this is something that would be routinely eaten unless you're kind of short on other greens. Uh, but actually nettles have another potential use in addition to <laughs> providing some nutrition theoretically. They can actually help relieve the joint pain of people who have rheumat rheumatism. And it's the, the process of using nettles to deliberately uh, cause that pain in, in, your, in your joints is called urtication. And basically the idea is that when you have that uh, chemical that's on the nettles and you put it in your joints, it ends up, it does hurt of course, but it also ends up uh, altering the signaling that's going on under your skin and so the pain from the rheumatism itself is decreased to some extent. Now another family that's on this list of of the top crime bosses in the botanical world is the Spurge family or the Euphorbiaceae. And a lot of these guys are things that we have um, kind of myths about. So you might have heard about, you know, poinsettias being horrific plants to have around. They're going to kill your cat at the holidays. Uh, pencil cactus is another, sometimes called pencil tree. Castor bean is another, which of course actually is quite bad. Um, and the rubber tree. And you'll notice that a lot of these are things that actually you have within your very own house. Certainly poinsettias and rubber trees and pencil cactus is uh, growing in popularity both in, in your house and outside in the yard. And actually um, all of these are kind of, they can look quite different from each other but they're united in that they all produce an irritating kind of milky looking sap that can burn and scar the skin. And they also contain some, or they may contain some powerful poisons. Interestingly, poinsettia is actually not nearly as bad uh, as people think that it is. So if, if your cat does in fact eat a little bit of it, or if your dog does, um, it probably, you know, it may not feel as great as it normally does, but it's highly unlikely to actually kill your animals. They would have to eat a tremendous amount of these plants. Uh, pencil cactus is another kind of funny one because I used to work in um, a greenhouse when I was doing my master's and my PhD. And the first day I showed up on the job, I was kind of being taken around and given a tour to, so that they could point out which plants I'd be taking care of and what different ways and which ones I kind of needed to know certain things about. And one of these was a big pencil cactus that was, uh, was kind of in a big arch shape over top of one of the doorways. And the lady who ran the greenhouse was kind of new and she said, look, I don't, I don't really know about this plant, but I'm told that it has a sap that if it falls in your eyes, it'll make you blind. So you have to be really careful. And so the whole time I was working in there, I was completely paranoid. And I kept thinking, why in the world have they put this plant over a doorway that people walk through? You can't even enter the greenhouse without going under this plant. And after all this time, I finally found out that actually, it wouldn't be great, but it's not going to make you go blind. So all that panic that I had all the time was completely unwarranted. Um, but the rubber tree is one that actually is quite toxic. Um, in a different, for a different reason than pencil cactus, but it does contain a, a quite potent sap, and that's one that you do want to keep your pets away from in the house. So you should definitely make sure that you've got some kind of guard around the bottom of it, or you put it up high to make sure that your animals aren't munching on it at all. Now the last plant that I want to mention in this, this kind of uh, naughty list is the, the carrot parsley family, and this APACA. And these guys have Another, like the nightshade family, they contain just lots and lots of plants that, that we really couldn't live without. And that includes carrots and dill, fennel, parsley, anise, lovage, chervil, parsnips, caraway, coriander, angelica, celery, the list goes on and on. And, uh, of course, because we eat a lot of these things, you know that there are, are at least some parts of the plant that aren't bad for you. But even the ones that we do eat can be uh, bad depending on which portion you're eating or the circumstances in which you're encountering it. So for example, a lot of these are actually phototoxic, which means that if you touch them and uh, c come into contact with the, the different products, whether they're oils or just regular chemicals that kind of are sitting on their skin, if you get those onto your skin and then go out into the sunlight, then it can cause basically kind of like a sunburn. And, and you might not even notice this. You might just think that you've been you know, burned because the sun was on you in a certain way. But actually, it's the chemicals from the plants themselves. And some of the ones that cause these sorts of rashes are celery and dill and parsley and parsnips. Um, and another, uh, actually, bishop's weed is another example. And that one is so phototoxic that actually exposure to the seeds 
can permanently darken your skin. So these things are pretty hardcore. Now other members of the family are dangerous for different reasons, and those include water hemlock and poison hemlock, giant hogweed, and cow parsnip. So all of these contain not only the skin irritants that I mentioned before, but also neurotoxins. And the real danger of these guys is that they can easily be mistaken for edible members of the family. And in fact, um, there was a, a Scottish man that was killed in the mid-19th mid century because his kids went out and they were picking plants and they then made him a sandwich and they put some poison hemlock on the sandwich thinking that it was something else and he ate it and very quickly died. Now someone else that died from one of these plants is quite famous and that's Socrates and you'll probably have heard this at some point or another. So uh, supposedly in, in Scotland poison hemlock is known as dead man's oatmeal uh, and I'm not sure if that's actually true or not, but this concoction was given to Socrates in 399 after he was found guilty of, of corrupting the youths. And uh, basically, this, the process of his death was written about in, in quite uh, vivid detail. And to be honest, if you're going to go, it sounds like this actually would, <laughs> wouldn't be such a bad way to do it. And later on, having read about these records of, of Socrates' death, there was a... Um, a 19th century doctor here in Britain who said, okay, I, I really want to know if it's actually like that or not. But of course he didn't want to die. That would be kind of the ultimate experiment. Uh, so he took really low doses and then wrote about what it felt like to have had these chemicals introduced into his body. And basically what he said was that it felt as though the, the go, and that's a quote, the go had been taken out of him. And it caused him to feel quite heavy and very tired, but actually he was quite lucid the entire time. So little by little, his legs were getting uh, heavier and heavier and more and more tired. And it kind of moved up to his waist and then up to his chest. Uh, and that's very similar to what was described for Socrates, who eventually, he was kind of walking around until it all just became so heavy that he had to sit and then finally lie flat. Um, and this guy, this uh, British physician, he said that actually it, it was very peaceful um, and that, you know, slowly that just kind of receded and then he felt quite normal again. And if you are interested in staying away from this, hopefully, uh, you should know that in order to tell poison hemlock apart from some of the other members of the family, you can notice that the stems are hollow, and then it might be speckled with purple blotches. And these are often called Socrates' blood. And uh, reportedly, the leaves of this smell quite bad. So, and again, I'm quoting here, they should smell either like parsnips or mice. So if you encounter a plant like this in the wild, you most definitely want to stay away from it and do not put it in any sandwiches.